All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here at ArcViews now almost every week in your living room um, series of webinars. We're so excited to chat today about an area that I think is fascinating. And for those of us in cannabis, we may be familiar with what's happening in this wild world of edibles, but many people are not. In fact, they might be surprised about some of the things we're going to talk about today. So if you don't know me, my name is Cody Sanchez, and I am a partner at Entourage Effects Capital one of the longest standing and largest uh, venture capital firms in the space who had the honor of being able to invest in ArcView and I sit on ArcView's board. If you don't know ArcView, then um, you're in for a treat. You see, what ArcView tries to do is really make life easier for all of those coming to invest, support the ecosystem, and grow in the wide world of cannabis. So everyone who's anyone, an angel investing in startup land, has probably had some time on an ArcView stage. You'll see from some of those here today that exact same story. The part that I think is fascinating about this world, and I get to open up these segments really just with my musings and Miranda, uh, meandering mind, and the part that I think is fascinating is if you look at the evolution of cannabis consumption and how we used to do it to today, you would actually be amazed. Because back in the day, I have a couple little prompts here for you. Back in the, the day, this is what cannabis packaging looked like. You guys may or may not, wink, wink, have a friend that uh, was delivered something like flour in a package just like this. And the, the industry has come so far from this that is really only able to be shown with imagery if a word is worth, uh, if an image is worth a thousand words. Look at what the packaging looks like today in the wide world of cannabis. So this is one of our portfolio companies. It's called Can. This is a microdosed THC social tonic. So do you guys remember how, um, you know, White Claw took this the world by storm um, last summer when we actually had a summer that was sociable and um, those social tonics were all around the world. Well, Can is trying to do the same thing and the packaging is pretty brilliant. First of all, they're a little cheeky. Uh, these are brands that have a personality and that have an ethos to who they are. You're going to hear from some of the experts at creating ethos, like Paul Rosen, like Christy from Kiva. Speaking of Kiva, we've got edibles in chocolate form. This is one from the lady you're about to hear about today, um, who is one of really the pioneers in manufacturing and mainstreaming edibles. And you have really packaging from everything that you can imagine. This is another one of our portfolio companies, Mr. Moxie's Mints that? Can you see that? Uh, and essentially what these are are small CBD mints, reminiscent of perhaps Altoids that you guys might be familiar with. Uh, and these bad boys, these are hemp honey sticks. I give them to my grandmother, actually. She suffers from rheumatoid arthritis. So the world and the times in cannabis, they are a change in, my friends. You see, we've gone from plastic baggies to product manufacturing. We've gone from plastic baggies to CPG category packaging. And really, I think that trend shows across the entire space. There's some fun stats that I have here for you. So I'm gonna try a little experiment where I get to share my screen with you. And I am gonna show you what else is happening in the world of cannabis edibles. In fact, if you aren't aware, how about the fact that everybody's favorite homemaker, Martha Stewart, is partnering with Canopy Growth. They're about to release some products. It was announced quite some time ago. They're just now looking to release products related to edibles. Um, there's also rumorings of product relationships with Drake. One of our own portfolio companies, Thunderstorm, just did, get this, it is a partnership with HBO to sell THC gummies promoting a new TV series. Look at this packaging. The TV series is called Close Enough. And if you look real closely, a little play on words there for you, you'll see the Max original on the label. So what you're seeing here is HBO branded edibles. Just let that ruminate and sink in for a second for all of those who say that cannabis is not mainstreaming. And that shows further this move from illegal to essential and how fast it is happening right in front of us. These are far from the only two. We've had Seth Rogen involved. There's talks of Lady Gaga getting involved. You know, there are comedians like Chelsea Handler. And guess what they're all getting involved with? Most of them are playing in the edible space because it's no longer just about flour. It's also now about how can you take these products and increase the margin on them in order to do CPG type products. 
Not sure what's going on there with Jeremy, but I think Jeremy, if you could turn off your video there for me, that'd be awesome. Um, cool wine in the background, speaking of another type of edible. Um, the, the part that I wanna leave you with today, when you're listening to all of these individuals on the webinar, is that the world that we are coming into is changing rapidly in cannabis. The part that I want you to think about it as investors is it's no longer okay to have subpar packaging, branding, and consumer goods. You have some big brands to compete with. And so if you investors are moving into this realm of CPG, shelves are getting crowded. It's starting to look more like a Whole Foods than it's starting to look like somebody's back of their sedan. This world is accelerating as we've never seen before in the cannabis landscape. The amazing part is edibles are the fastest growing category. We're going to have BDS up next to talk about this. Certainly varies state by state, but the key is everybody's game has to step up and we get to hear from some of the greats who have done that consistently across product lines. So with that, let me read to you a bio of one of those who are going to give us some interesting aspects into it and a little bit of uh, a thank you because one of the things that's so important for you to know is that here at ArcView, we give away these webinars for free to all of you to educate users on cannabis, to educate consumers, to educate um, cannabis companies and investors, but we can't do it without our sponsors. And so I wanna give a special thank out, uh, shout out, thank out to Ama Healing, whose latest product, Elevate Elixir, is, the new, is a new conscious drink mixer that provides all the buzz without the booze. You can save 20% using code ARCVIEW. So you can go to Ama Healing's website and use that. I've actually seen some of your Instagram um, ads. It's a really cool idea of being able to create your own drink um, in a way that maybe doesn't have all the calories and the next day regrets. So thank you, Ama, for being here with us. Now, let me introduce uh, one of my favorite companies that we also invested in, um, BDSA. So Jessica Lucas is the SVP of commercial development at BDSA. And um, the, the BDS group is fascinating. I read their uh, research almost on a daily basis and utilize it on the back end. They are a premier market research firm serving the global cannabinoid industry. Jessica is one of the most sought after market research experts surveying the cannabis market. She really prides herself in making data come to life. So let's see if she does that through storytelling and act actionable insights. Together with her team, she works with manufacturers, retailers, investors like us to deliver unmatched insights and analytics to drive their business forward. I have in front of me actually an example of one of the uh, BDS analytics um, emails that I get on a daily basis that's pretty phenomenal. Let me show it to you. So this is an email that we get on a monthly basis that basically talks about each individual state and what are the trends inside of each individual state. You can see here, this is the market of California, that BDSA is talking about the ingestibles or the edibles market here at the bottom and shows some of the growth in the market overall, seven and 8% and month over month and um, month over year basis and which segments within are growing and which segments are not. So these insights are invaluable. Jessica, I am super excited for you to teach me a few things and everybody should listen up for this and the rest of our segment. Thank you so much, Cody. I'm excited to be here today. I'm gonna to go ahead and share my screen. Um, as Cody mentioned, I lead up our client relations um, and commercial development at BDSA. A quick intro and uh, Cody, thanks for giving us the shout out, but we cover um, what is selling. So tracking exactly what is selling in the dispensary channel. Um, we also cover consumer evolution, consumer market, consumer dynamics. Um, and we're constantly forecasting, predicting what we believe will happen over the next five years as we think about the global cannabinoid market. Um, today, I have 10 minutes and 10 minutes only. So I'll run through all of this pretty quickly. We'll cover everything at a pretty high level, but obviously if there are questions, follow-ups, feel free to reach out. Um, today, we're going to be focused on all things cannabinoid, edibles or ingestibles. Um, this covers both beverages and food and candy, um, both hemp-derived and marijuana-derived products. So as we think about the dispensary channel, selling both THC, CBD, and secondary cannabinoid products, and now mainstream retail um, with the emergence of hemp-derived CBD products in the mainstream channels. So with that, let's get started. Um, nice of Cody to throw a softball at me as my first slide is focused on um, marijuana and the acceptance really becoming mainstream. 
When we look at the mainstream, um, or sorry, if we look at the fully legal markets, so as we think about fully legal markets, these are adult use markets that have a retail landscape. Alaska, California, Colorado, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, uh, Massachusetts, and Illinois. Uh, I think I covered all eight of them. Um, and we look at those fully legal markets, almost 70% of adults 21 plus who live in these states currently consume cannabis or are open to it. Um, that's a really important number to call out, again, 70%. As we think about what that means, um, really about mainstream acceptance, people understanding what this is, the benefits it provides them. Um, this is no longer the stigmas of, um, frankly, I'm in Boulder, Colorado, so we're not talking about the 22-year-old in their parents' basement anymore. We're talking cross genders, uh, ages, genera generations, functional benefits, socioeconomic status, um, you name it, we're really breaking down those stigmas. Um, you know, again, as we think about edibles, um, ingestible products, there are a lot of preconceived notions just about how genders behave differently um, and how females don't inhale or females only want edibles or ingestibles. You name it, there's a lot of preconceived notions out there or myths. Um, and really, we're focused on busting those myths. So again, mainstream um, and continue, continued growth and acceptance. Um, just to call out a comparison point here, um, this again is current consumers and people who are open to consuming represents that about 70%. As you think about something like beverage alcohol, um, and you think about the same type of metrics, it's closer to 65 to 75% of the population in 21 plus who are consuming alcohol products. Um, so we're definitely not there yet. We have a long way to go, um, but think about that as a benchmark here. As we understand the marketplace and why people are consuming, um, consumption is really multifaceted, multipurpose. Um, really, people are looking for functional benefits. And so whether that is 100% social recreational, so people who are consuming on a Friday night while relaxing or unwinding with their significant other, a social recreational occasion, to people who are consuming 100% for medical reasons. Um, so keep in mind that would be somebody going through chemotherapy, utilizing cannabis on a day-to-day -to, -day to get through the day. Um, and every need state in between. So on a Wednesday night, um, experience the migraine or a Saturday, let's say, um, after a long run. Uh, you name it, um, people are consuming cannabis for many different reasons. Um, important to think about this as you think about the impact cannabis is having across the entire marketplace. Um, so impacting every consumer industry. A lot of people think about um, the substitution with beverage alcohol, but you also have to think about it in terms of um, OTC or over-the-counter medication, pharmaceuticals. Again, you name it. Um, people are consuming cannabis for, and we know that there are so many different product formats available to people that are infused with cannabinoids. We have a strategic partnership with IRI, um, and IRI, for those of you who do not know, very, very similar to what BDSA does, but they cover mainstream channels, grocery, drug, mass merchandisers like Walmart and Target, convenience, and so on. Um, and they do a ton of research for CPG, beverage, alcohol, and kind of those mainstream retail channels. And we know already, as we think about non-infused, so non-cannabinoid food and beverages, consumers are already seeking health, wellness, functional, medical benefits from the food and the products that they buy today. So it's not surprising to think about cannabinoids as another functional ingredient that makes food, beverage, and snacking um, healthier, part of their lifestyle, and more functional. So when we break down the cannabis consumer marketplace, again, in fully legal states, over 70% of current cannabis consumers are consuming edibles and almost 35% prefer edibles. They're seeking convenience. They're seeking a discreet and familiar product format. Many perceive edibles not surprising to be a healthier consumption method than inhalables, as Cody mentioned earlier on. Um, there are still some hurdles that edibles companies are overcoming in terms of onset and offset and dosage and um, getting consumers that right experience. I'm sure many on the panel will speak to this. But again, a large percent of cannabis consumers consuming edibles and many preferring the edible format. When we break the marketplace down further and we think about those people um, we call cannabis acceptors. They don't currently consume, but they are open to it. Um, in these fully legal markets, about 50% of those people would consider an edible format. So again, these are people who don't currently consume in fully legal states um, that would be open to consuming. Many of those people looking for the benefits and looking to be open to consuming via an edible format. Again, as I mentioned, as we saw with the IRI data, people are already seeking functional benefits from food um, and their beverage products. Not surprising to see cannabinoid products fall in that same realm. So a good example of that. 
um, and a few of the panelists, uh, Jeremy from Lagunitas will speak to the bever beverage format specifically, but when you think about how you can see, consume beverages day to day, um, we have coffee to wake up or energize. Um, we have beverage alcohol products to relax, to unwind. Um, we have tea to relax, to help us sleep. Um, energy drinks, um, you know, sports drinks, you name it. There's a lot of functional benefits people are seeking through beverages. So again, not surprising to think about cannabinoids, CBD, THC, CBN, CBG, THCA, THCV as another functional ingredient in ingestible products. So as we think about this evolving marketplace, again, becoming mainstream, acceptance consumption is mainstream in fully legal markets where it's readily available in retail stores. These people seeking the benefits, the health, the wellness, and the social and recreational benefits from cannabis, including edibles. And again, as I just showed you, many of those people actually consuming and preferring edibles. It's not surprising to see extreme growth in the marketplace. So we forecast uh, the global cannabinoid market to be, um, sorry, the global regulated cannabis market to be about 47 billion by 2025. Um, so again, the penetration amongst the consumer population, consumption dynamics, purchasing, new product formats, destigmatization, de education, all of those driving this, this fully legal regulated market growth. Not surprising here, as you can see in the purple, US is the biggest market and specifically California is the largest global cannabis market. Really important to keep in mind, yes, Canada is impactful and big and federally legal, but California is and will continue to be the largest global cannabis market, driving the US again to be the top marketplace. And as we think about this cannabinoid market, specifically the dispensary channel, and we break down the size of the edible marketplace, um, edibles represent about 15% of dollar sales going through the dispensary channel. Um, and as you can see here, um, a lot of that is driven by candy and candy driven by gummies. So while market share has remained relatively flat over the years for edibles, around 15%, if we look at year to date 2020 over 2019, we're seeing the edibles market specifically grow about 20% in dollar sales. And as I outlined on the side of the chart or on the side of the pie chart, um, as we think about what are the drivers of purchase influences within edibles, it's not surprising and especially coming from a CPG background because we see this across all food and beverage, taste and flavor still matters. Price matters. People are looking for something they've used before that they're familiar with that they know they'll have a good experience. So again, consumer acceptance of marijuana, regulated cannabis, um, growing, becoming more mainstream. Many of those people seeking the functional benefits via an edible format. And we see candy, specifically gummies, driving a lot of this growth. But it's not just about the dispensary channel or the THC market. We also have to consider all of the other cannabinoids. So we break the marketplace down. And as I mentioned, we have a strategic partnership with IRI, which make, makes this very useful to do. When we break this down and think about both the marijuana drive market um, and the hemp derived market. And we think about the US as cannabinoid infused products. Um, we have to consider the fact that the dispensary channel remains the largest channel for people seeking cannabinoid products, whether those are THC represented here in the 27 billion, whether those are other cannabinoid products available in the dispensary like CBD products. Then you layer on top of that mainstream retail channels like grocery, drug stores, mass merch, convenience stores selling hemp derived CBD products. Um, so Kroger, 7-Eleven, you name it, you can walk in and buy hemp derived CBD products. And then you have your prescription ap applications like Epidiolex. So again, you think about total cannabinoids by 2024 in the US being $45 billion. It's not surprising to see that mainstream food and beverage companies are saying that the cannabinoid market is too big to ignore. And I'll specifically call out, I presented last week at a craft beverage craft alcohol conference virtually, as well as BevNet and NOSH. So again, there's a lot of eyes on this market in this industry and the growth is a primary reason that everyone's looking at it. And edibles and beverages specifically driving a lot of this growth. And we see that in the IRI track channels, again, mainstream food and beverage, um, just getting started. The FDA has not determined exactly how they're going to regulate CBD as a food additive, but you can still see the growth here. Again, this is grocery stores, drug stores, mass merchandisers like Walmart and Target, as well as C-stores. 
Um, so again, really important to call out here the growth of not just the THC marketplace and not just the dispensary, dispensary channel, but we also have to consider the growth of both hemp-derived and marijuana-derived CBD as a functional ingredient into edibles and beverages. So with that, a few key takeaways. Um, as I mentioned, edibles and beverages evolving and changing, um, new technology, new channels of distribution, again, outside of the dispensaries, changing trends, flavors, product formats, technology. Um, also, I outlined that many new consumers are entering the cannabis marketplace via edibles because it's a familiar format. It's something that they already use for functional benefits. Um, so as we saw across all markets and all industries, food and beverage is already utilized for these types of benefits. So it's not surprising to see cannabinoids as another functional ingredient that consumers are seeking um, when thinking about food, candy, snacks, and beverages. A couple of trends to call out, which I'm sure the panel is going to talk about, really driving the growth of edibles. Um, CBD products, both in the dispensary and outside of the dispensary. Um, many of the panelists have products in market. I think all of them actually have products in market that are selling very well that are higher CBD than they are THC. So those ratios now matter. Low dose microdose dosing products like Cody mentioned earlier on, another big driving force behind the growth of edibles and beverages. Elevated taste and flavor. Um, actually an elevated or more controlled experience. Um, talking about faster onset and offset, consistent dosages, all of those things really driving changes within the edible and beverage marketplace. So with that, I will close it out and send it back over to the panel. Hi, I hope you can hear me. This is Caroline Levy. Hi everybody, this is Caroline Levy. I'm the skeptic um, on this conversation. I've been a stock analyst for about 30 years on Wall Street covering beverages and over the years, restaurants, food, and various other consumer companies. I'm excited to host a great panel today. Jeremy Marshall, who studied brewing at UC Davis, is joining us from Lagunitas. He says his dueling passions for cannabis and hops found a good home at Lagunitas Brewing, um, a company known for much more than craft beer. His official title is Brewmaster, or shall we say brew monster, um, but he's currently very involved in innovation and R&D and he gets vacuumed into marketing. His passions, farms, farmers, turps, consumer interaction and engagement um, and mentoring. So Jeremy, thank you for joining us and welcome. Christy Palmer is co-founder and president of Kiva Brands. Um, Christy and her husband, Scott, founded this very successful business in 2010 in their kitchen in California, the Bay Area. Um, it's grown to be one of the most widely recognized cannabis companies today. So she's passionate about finding innovative ways to get more people to consume cannabis. And we will definitely speak about innovation with Christy. Paul Rosen is our third panelist. Welcome, Paul. He is very interested in delicious foods that are infused, he says, lightly infused with cannabis. Um, Paul is the co-founder and chairman of Pantry. Pantry sells functional food crafted by award-winning chefs made with the highest quality ingredients. Um, it's privately held and one of the fastest growing infused food brands in California. Uh, Paul's been one of the most active entrepreneurs in cannabis having served, founded and served as CEO of the Cronus Group and Tidal Royalty Corp. And he also today serves as executive chairman of Global Go, an LA-based cannabis advisory. He's passionate about brands that promote wellness, authenticity, and put the consumer's health and wellness at the center and forefront. So I'd like to open the panel with a question just asking each of you to bring us up to date on how growth has been this year, given the COVID situation, um, just a little bit of how are you doing versus what you might have expected? And I'll start with Christy, please. Perfect. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here, everybody. Welcome. Um, so this year has been a, a bit of a mixed bag. Um, in California specifically, that's where Kiva um, operates its own um, manufacturing and distribution companies. And, um, you know, we started the beginning of the year um, thinking things were going to go great. 
Um, then COVID hit and it was really up in the air if even cannabis businesses were gonna be allowed to operate. Um, so being deemed an essential business was um, a lifesaver, quite frankly, and um, has allowed us to continue to operate and keep our employees um, in the business and everybody getting paychecks. Um, it's been really interesting to see um, what's happened with demand. Uh, I think people are at home. I know alcohol consumption has gone up. Uh, cannabis consumption has gone up. Uh, cannabis consumers um, are shown to use cannabis when they're by themselves more often than um, to consume alcohol when, them, when they're by themselves. So it really is shown to be um, kind of the perfect product uh, for the situation that we're all in. Great, thank you so much, Jeremy. Yes, hello. I uh, wish we were all together in person because I miss that, uh, that vibration from personal interaction along with finding out which of my fellow panelists might be a hugger. Uh, I'm just not gonna find that out until later, right? But we will. Um, thank you for having me. Um, so, uh, you know, COVID times, um, for us, we are the number one uh, single serve in the state of California, and we're growing about 50%. And I was thinking about like one thing that's different, you know, um, Typically, you don't share an edible, and in the past, you know, people would share, um, you know, a, a joint or something. So uh, it used to be uh, sharing was caring, and now all of a sudden, not sharing is caring. So uh, beverages, even though they're off to a slower start than I think people anticipated, it, it, originally people thought it was just going to be this explosive thing, and it was going to rival um, alcohol, but I, I do feel that they are relevant during this time because you, you don't typically share your beverage. You know, you show up at a party, you bring a beer, you don't, you don't typically uh, pass it around, right? So um, the social, socialization factor um, allowed by beverages, I think is uh, a, a really nice thing. It, it's just that we are uh, all cautious about socializing and we're social creatures, we will do it again. Got it, and Paul, I'd love you to weigh in. We can't hear you, I don't think. Sorry about that. Hello, everybody. Now you can hear me. Uh, really happy to be on this panel. Thanks to our audience at home and to my co-panelists and everyone else. Uh, this has been fascinating to me. So just, you know, quite succinctly, cannabis generally as an asset class has held up quite well during COVID. Uh, if you measure it by consumption, our consumption has steadily risen. Uh, there's a number of factors for this. A lot of it is the stay at home of it all. There's just a lot more personal time. People that might be inclined to consume after hours can now consider the work Day during hours. So I think both for alcohol, which I would not recommend over consuming during the day, but for cannabis, likely more people are using it during the day because at the public workplace, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to. I think specifically though, for our category, we'll call it food and beverage or edibles. There has been a specific shift in our industry from consumers considering form factors that don't go through the lungs. Given that COVID is a respiratory illness, uh, it kind of makes sense to me that if you want to consume cannabis, and I, I love cannabis, I've, cons I've smoked enough joints to circ circle the earth, but I've stopped smoking prior to COVID because I just, at this point in my life, I don't want to tax my lungs. They're, they're, I'm going to retire them, Hall of Fame duty, and I'm looking for form factors that, go, that do not address my lungs. Certainly for COVID, a respiratory illness, I think we've seen a meaningful move from people that maybe were a little trepidatious about going into edibles, just were used to the sort of the culture and the social of smoking, now we're going to edibles because they view it as essentially safer. And I fully endorse that concept that ultimately cannabis is a wellness product or a medicine. And the form factors that we expect our patients or consumers to consume with should meet the wellness criteria, which I think edibles more naturally and beverages more naturally can speak to wellness than smoking a joint. Although, as I said, I have no uh, prejudice against people that smoke joints for myself. I'm, mo I'm moving into food anyways, because I just feel it's a safer choice for me. That's great. I'm going to jump to Christy again and just ask about the challenges of marketing and building a brand when advertising is, um, if not forbidden, very, very restricted. Um, when you think about the competition for your products, do you welcome or uh, 
get anxious about new competition. Do you feel at this point, the goal is to just grow the market and the more people who come in with high quality products, the better. Um, so again, just talk about brand building, how you go about that um, in your category. Yeah, um, I think competition is is awesome. Um, without more competitors, and we've seen this um, over the years since we've been in business for almost 10 years now, um, we need high quality competitors to build the shelf and build the category, right? People don't only want chocolate or only want gummies. They want beverages, which Kiva doesn't make. They want pills, which Kiva doesn't make. So um, it's it's important for us all to um, to create high quality products that appeal to a wide range of people. So um, more competition, the better. It's great for the consumer. And when the consumer is consistently getting a high quality product that strengthens cannabis overall and makes it more mainstream, makes it more legitimate and makes, uh, makes products available to people's grandmothers, for example. So it just adds more trust and more uh, legitimacy to the industry. Um, marketing products without mainstream channel channels just means we have to get more creative. And I think as cannabis companies, um, creativity is sort of has to be in your DNA <laughs> um, because there's always roadblocks being thrown up and you have to be able to figure out how to jump over them or you'll be left behind. So um, uh, social media has been a really great one for us using influencers, um, doing Facebook Live, doing Instagram Live, um, just exploring other channels and, and getting creative has been really successful for us. Thank you, that's great. Um, Jeremy, do you wanna call out what you think has been the most successful marketing effort um, for Hi-Fi Hops? Well, uh, remember it's, a little bit tricky for us, right? Because um, people associate us with being a brewery, but just off the top of my head, top, top of my head is gonna be Outside Lands last year in San Francisco. Uh, recall, for those of you who know, they uh, had a little area cordoned off called Grasslands. And we set up an amazing uh, kind of pop-up uh, hi-fi station and it was quite popular and it was amazing to see and even more amazing to hear that uh, they were very brave to do this and uh, all in grasslands didn't have a, a single incident everyone was civil and well behaved and that part made me very happy that's fabulous and in terms of competition who is your competition in you know in the liquid uh, cannabis well, business? Um, yeah, keep in mind, liquids uh, are a niche product. And of course, their uh, biggest challenge is their weight and the fact that you need a bottling line. Um, mm -hmm. It was interesting hearing Jess talk about IRI because that's a, that same company gives us a lot of uh, data. Um, they run the data on all the Bevalk and, and beer. And so you have this very, very heavy, I'll never forget, uh, someone showed up and they had a backpack on and they said, I've got $20,000 in this back of inventory in this backpack, so I'm not going to take it off. And, you know, I had to point and say, you see those five trucks, those five trucks might have $20,000 worth of inventory. So it's, it's heavy and it's not so easy. So not just anybody can jump in. Um, I don't really know who our competitors are. I mean, there, there, there's, there's Keefe and then there's Know, California Dreamin. There's a lot of really good uh, beverages out there, and and uh, and and the one that was shown earlier, which I just had, that has the cardamom in it, which I really liked. And each one has a different appeal. Um, they're they're all so different. Um, you know, some of them are sweet, some of them are in the middle, some of them have nothing, uh, some of them are, are teas. Um, there really is a little something for everyone. So I, I, it's hard for me to answer that. Thank you, though. Paul, um, how do you build brands? Um, and you're doing a number of different things. What is your strategy? Is it to try a number of things, see what really hits, and then put the weight and effort behind one of them? Or you're just going to build a portfolio? Yeah. I mean, we're a, a scrappy startup, so we don't have a lot of capital to misspend on initiatives. We've got to be really, really sure that we're going to get an ROI, or at least as sure as we can be. I think the challenge we all face in the cannabis industry, though, is trying to develop a direct relationship with our consumer. That's a really difficult thing. So I can sell to a dispensary, but I need then the dispensary to champion my product versus another product. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do at Pantry, and I'm sure most of my colleagues are doing the same thing, is 
we try to build a relationship directly with our customers so we can create demand. If I have to rely upon a butt tender, God bless them, to push my product, you know, maybe they will, but they, they may not. There may be a reason why they want to move another product that day. But if I can empower a customer to walk into a dispensary and say, I want pantry, knowing that hopefully, hopefully they have it, I got a better chance of making that sale. So what we are trying to do is establish our authenticity as a brand that actually is concerned about our consumers' welfare and their experience. So one of the things the cannabis industry, and I'm not speaking to anyone on this panel, just generally, I don't think we've shown enough respect to our customer as the ultimate constituency to take care of. We've worried about our shareholders. We've worried about the regulator. We've worried about, you know, in some cases, even our stock price. But what we really need to ultimately focus on is the consumer and make sure that we're delivering a pleasant, if not uh, enhanced experience for them. So one thing that we've done that as at least has sort of helped, and we're trying to build a, uh, if you will, a consumer mouth by mouth by mouth, is we've been doing a lot of activation dinners where we will have a pantry infused dinner. We'll bring in a top chef with pedigree. We'll cook a non-infused meal because it has to be legal for 100, 120 people that are in the industry or that might be influencers, might be buyers. And we'll just have a, a good time. There will be cannabis consumed on the premises. We'll have a suite of pantry products. But we find that by creating a sort of a tactile sensory experience, it imbues very well on our brand. And, you know, it's a ground game dinner by dinner, influencer by influencer, customer by customer. But in the long term, I think that's how all brands succeed. Really to me, a brand is a promise between a customer and the company to say, if you consume my product, this is the predictable experience that you will have. And if we keep that promise, which I think we're all making our best efforts to keep, then we'll do well at getting the consumer to buy our products. Thank you, Paul. I'm going to... Um speed us up a tiny bit because we've we've got about 10 minutes i think um let's talk about distribution jeremy could we start with you you talked about the fact that your product is heavy and it's quite expensive i think to make it and get it to the consumer talk to me about the distribution challenges talk to us and um any opportunities you see yeah well um that's one area that I know the least about because uh, our, our partner handles most of that, but obviously the biggest challenge is the fact that it's extremely heavy mm. and it's uh, not easy to move around. And um, furthermore, in, in, um, in our industry, but maybe less so in the cannabis beverages, there's the need for refrigeration, which yep. is another yep. thing that I think you see uh, because one really nice thing about refrigeration is it means that you can offset uh, the need for pasteurization or anything uh, preservatives. And I think, you know, um, having a clean label is, you know, very, very important. And uh, refrigeration is something that I think we're going to see rear its head as the industry matures. Um, obviously, the biggest challenge is the fact that we don't have federal anything and as we all know in our heads that's what it's going to take to fix this little issue with the the white to gray to black market you know i was just thinking mm -hmm. in my head another COVID thing is that the, the state coffers are empty and this could be very very good for legalization uh coming into 2021 and 2022 because they're going to be looking around like uh we really need some some funds right and if uh, we can get federal then distribution gets a whole lot easier because we have to make it and package it and dis distribute it within each state. So it, it's impossible to yeah. figure out, uh, you know, other states are very, to get very the very economies good. of scale and, and yeah. all that, that, that you want mm -hmm. in a packaged foods business, uh, uh, packaged yeah. beverages. Yeah. Uh, those are, those are great points. Uh, Christy, in terms of distribution, does your product need refrigeration and, and does it have, is it all natural? Just talk to us about the distribution challenges, yeah. opportunities. Yeah, um, definitely temperature sensitive. So we do have to keep that in mind, um, as is flour and other products that we do distribution for um, as well. So temperature is a concern. Um, I would say some of, the, some of the biggest hurdles are state by state. Um, and the fact that you can't ship. If you could just have your manufacturing facility in California, make a million units and send them off mm -hmm. to Massachusetts or Illinois, I mean, that would be amazing, right? That's what all other food companies do. 
Um, mm -hmm. But in cannabis, we're extremely limited and we can't do that. We have to set up our operations in each state, follow that state's regulations, reformulate our products to meet the proper um, concentration levels that they want in that state. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about spreading your brand and creating a national brand, you, you, know, you have to jump through all of those hoops and basically start a business in each state in order to distribute nationwide. Um, and then within the state of California, we're seeing a lot of um, difficulties getting products to shelves because as Cody mentioned in her intro, um, it's, a crowded, it's a crowded marketplace and there's a lot of competition and a lot of products um, really competing for that shelf space. And they're, um, they're trying to win the hearts of bud tenders they're spending marketing dollars, they're um, raising money and spending marketing dollars. So it's, um, it's pretty cutthroat out there um, right now for distribution. But uh, I think having a quality product and delivering that over and over and over to your consumer to gain their trust is um, still has proven for us to be um, a great strategy. Thank you. In the interest of time, Paul, I'm going to throw a different one at you, which is what regulatory changes would be the most helpful or that you see coming sooner rather than later that you think can just take everything you do to the next level? I mean, the moonshot would be um, the current president descheduling cannabis as an October surprise prior to the next election, try to push, push uh, the Republicans over the edge. The real moonshot for me, and I say this as a non-political Canadian, would be that happening and then the Democrats winning office. But uh, short of descheduling, then we're looking at incremental progress. The passage of the SAFE Act, sometimes called the Banking Act, would be really, really transformative for our industry. Once you allow big banks into the cannabis industry, you can rest assured that they're going to lobby the heck for the full-blown legalization. The concern I would just have is uh, uh, not a deschedule of cannabis, but a reschedule down to Schedule 2. Uh, for policy geeks at home, that means that it is a, has medicinal benefit but great harm of abuse, and that could bring the FDA into all the grow rooms across all 33 states, which uh, I can assure you very few operators right now would meet an FDA level audit. It's a very different level of what they expect in, in, a, in these facilities. I don't think that's going to happen. So what I really predict will be incremental work through Congress, the SAFE Act, a few other acts, and then I predict that there will be federal legalization, hopefully by descheduling cannabis sometime between 2020 and 2022. And any one of these events in isolation are going to accelerate this industry. But once we can see the end of prohibition in our front view mirror, that's going to be the biggest signal of all that the industry is ready to go seismic. So just um, anyone want to add to that on the regulatory side? Any big moves that would be super helpful? You think my yeah, lowering, um, lowering taxes would be a huge one um, in California in particular, making products more accessible. So right now only 30% of cities in California actually allow retail. So um, just opening up access to the marketplace so that um, people can just uh, drive one to two miles um, or have a delivery service come into their city uh, to get cannabis products would be huge. Can I, I just ask a, the panel? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jeremy. Oh, I, I would just add criminal justice reform because uh, it's perfectly obvious to all of us that it's a system designed to disproportionately affect, you know, people of color. And I think something's got to give. Well, it certainly seems like we're in a period of massive, massive change and, and you know, it feels seismic. And I guess, does anyone disagree? with the fact that most of the current situation actually favors uh, further growth in cannabis, specifically in edibles. Anyone want to, I think, I think we agree. And I'm a skeptic. I have to say on the beverage side, I've been very skeptical. I used to cover um, canopy growth indirectly through Constellation and really felt that it just wasn't a cost-effective way to deliver the product. And, you know, what we're talking about, I think, when you talk about premium, high quality products, they're going to be priced at a pretty high point, And that's going to make it, by definition, a niche market. But that can change. You know, it's just a question of when that tipping point is. Um, anyone want... Yeah, go ahead. The status quo favors the incumbents right now in the industry. We've got large organizations, MSOs, some individual brands that right now are in a sweet spot. They are, if you will, in the door, through the door in the house. They're doing very well. Their revenue is growing. But as long as cannabis remains a Schedule One narcotic, 
mostly large CPG, large pharma, large alcohol, not tobacco, simply cannot enter the industry. There's a giant reputational moat, and that moat is allowing the incumbents to reach a certain scale that when the moat drops, they're, they are too big to beat. They're either going to have to be bought or built alongside. For sure. Anyone want to add to that? We only have a few seconds left. Yeah, I couldn't agree more that um, as much as we want to see federal legalization, it definitely has created um, an opportunity for small business. Well, I want to thank our panelists. You, you've been amazing. I've got a million other questions for you, such as what induced you to get into this in the first place? There's a lot to talk about, but I have to hand over um, to the Q&A session. Hopefully we'll be able to get to one of those million questions uh, with the audience Q&A here. Hi everybody, this is Lewis, one of the VPs here at ArcView. Uh, I be, I'm here to moderate some of the questions here. First of all, I want to apologize if I don't get to your question. There are more than 400 of you on the call and over 30 questions that were asked and we just don't have the time to get to all of them. But I will pick one or two. And uh, one of the questions uh, is about taste. We are on the call about edibles and drinkables, and Becky Bush has this question. I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. Um, are you finding, and this is for all the panelists here, are you finding consumers want to actually taste the, uh, the, the, the taste of the THC or the taste of cannabis in their product, or would they rather have it almost undetectable? I, it's a point of debate in, amongst my friends, it's, and it's almost like uh, it's almost like IPA and hops, right? You love IPAs because you love the taste of hops or you have the other side that just absolutely doesn't want anything to do with that. Um, so do you see that sort of differentiation uh, with um, cannabis consumers as well? And do you have products that sort of uh, go either way to address the market that loves the taste of cannabis versus those that don't? Um, why don't we start with uh, Christy with that question, then Paul and Jeremy. Yeah, great. Um, I think people um, don't mind tasting the cannabis as long as it's not bong water. Um, that they're tasting in their edible. I think you could go the wrong direction with tasting cannabis, um, and then you can go the right direction. So you can enhance those flavors. You can marry well with the cannabis flavors to create um, something a little more sophisticated, like an adult beverage kind of flavor, like something like you just mentioned with hops and beer, having a, um, a sophisticated flavor profile, I think is what people are looking for right now. Yeah, I would concur with that completely. A note could be very, uh, you know, part of the experience, but if it tastes too potty, personally, uh, it's very individual for me. If it's too potty, I just don't like it. I feel like I'm, you know, chewing a plant. Uh, if it has a complex array of flavors, uh, and one of those notes is a is is derived from the plant, and it's sort of botanical rather than overwhelming. Then I think it really does make sense. Uh, but no two consumers are exactly alike. Certainly at Pantry, we're trying to make our food not taste too potty. I, I would add that the distillate uh, can kind of have like a dirt taste, or uh, people just say it tastes like dirt, and that's uh, not well liked. But terpenes are like the the magic of plants. And if it's a really, really elegant terpene structure, then I think it is good. Awesome. All right, and let's get to this question from John Paul. Uh, you know, one of the um, common um, uh, common issues with edibles and drinkables is the onset time. People gravitate towards in inhalation, inhalation based products because you can feel it just like that, right? And I know there's been a lot of uh, breakthroughs in technology for faster onset times or, or faster effect times. Can you speak to any of the science that you're paying attention to or what sort of advances that you're paying attention to to um, allow for the faster onset of edibles? Um, let's go in reverse order this time, Jeremy, Paul, then Christy. Uh, I guess I can start. It's, um, you know, in, in, in your lungs, you have the surface area of uh, tennis courts, but as we talked about earlier, it's, it's not healthy to smoke and vape. So when something enters your digestive tract, instead of uh, Delta-9 THC, your liver converts it to hydroxy-11. So it's all about just speeding that up. And uh, I'm no scientist, but I am a nerd. And that's just about uh, particle size and getting the particles uh, smaller and smaller. And the bottom line though, is that you don't have the surface area. So uh, an, an edible is never gonna behave like an inhalable uh, because the surface area is just not there. Uh, however, you can buck those particles down to the point of a uh, realistic, let's say uh, 10 to 15 minute onset time. But it really depends on what, what's in your stomach and what you've had to eat that day. Mm -hmm. um, um, what? Yeah, yeah, as a consumer and now as a manufacturer, uh, I, I, I do prefer to have 
quick onset. I think I won't bore the audience with what particular tech we offer at Pantry, but suffice it to say, the whole industry uh, is working towards solutions that are going to uh, improve on that time, and it kind of makes sense. Uh, what we really want to have is a predictable experience. I don't mind, you know, the waiting is a little bit kind of fun in a way, just to Jeremy, to your point, there was something group social about four people taking an edible. And then it's like popcorn kernels popping at minute 10, someone puts up their hand, they've had the first activation. It's kind of fun in a way, and it does bring a social element to it. I think it's expected that you should have, uh, the, the effect should start with 10 minutes of consumption. It will never be immediate like a beverage will be, to, or, or smoking, to Jeremy's point. But I think we're getting to the point where you're going to start to feel activated within 10 minutes, and then about an hour later, you're going to start to feel that you've climbed the hill and you're on your way back down. And that's what the industry is going to reach across the board. It's not going to be for a while. One company may assert that they've got a fast action, but you're looking at an industry-wide phenomenon where technology will be essentially shared or mimicked and you'll get fast activation. It's coming right now. Jamie's point, smaller particles, nano particularization is very real right now and it will improve the overall user experience. And that so. will give edibles a big leg up um, in comparison to flour and um, Inhalables, because right now I think that is a big downside, is you take an edible, wait an hour or two to feel the effects. Where will you be in an hour or two? Or um, can you imagine going out for drinks with a friend and uh, sitting around with a beer and then an hour later feeling your beer? <laughs> You'd be there all night drinking beer. So um, it's a little bit hard to stack the effects. So I think that really is um, the next wave and will um, really increase the popularity of edibles this fast onset. Well, thank you so much. Well, that's all the time that we have for questions. Uh, I apologize again that we weren't able to get to them. Um, like I said, there's still more than 400 of you on the call, but please do stick around. We have a few, uh, few closing thoughts. Jeremy, Paul, Christy, Caroline, thank you so much for your insights and being on the panel today. Virtual hugs, virtual hugs. <laughs> Uh, and now I'd like to turn things over to Jake Chusrock from our team, VP of Business Development, for Jake's Sponsor Corner with, uh, uh, with Alma Healing. Uh, so Jake, over to you. All right, everybody. Just trying to get my video on, and there it is. Excellent. Good to see everybody. Uh, and I am so happy to be joining today in talking with Ted of Ama Healing. So we have, of course, Ted Moskovitz, co-founder of Ama Healing. Uh, Ted, it's great to see you, as always. Uh, Likewise, man. A, a virtual hug to you as well. Tell us in your own words, what makes Elevate different from typical CBD beverages like those we see in cans? Yeah, I think the conversation that we just had is a perfect lead in, right? Um, so, you know, one of the reasons is that Elevate is essentially a choose your own flavor adventure, right? Um, and your experience with it is really limited only by your own creativity. Um, you can mix in with any beverage. And so we have people coming up with their own recipes and, and ways of using it. You know, people putting it on like even lollipops and things like that. So I think the element of, of having your own sort of creativity is one of the big differentiators. And then the second one is immediacy, right? We just had the amazing point made of like, it would be crazy to wait an hour for your beer to kick in. And so I think one of the reasons that, you know, the product has been very popular is, you know, a lot of people claim to feel it right away, but peak onset within, you know, 10 to 15 minutes faster for some. And so you really have the ability to titrate it to have the experience that you want, right? So many of us have probably had that edibles experience where, you know, you take one, you wait, you don't feel it, you have another one, right? And, and we all sort of know where yeah. that's going. And so I think, you know, being able to have a highly individualized experience that's not pre-measured, that you can decide how much is going in um, is one of the other reasons that it's, it's doing well, yeah. For sure. And, and needless to say, your team brings a wide range of, of different expertise to the table after seeing a lot of success in other industries. I mean, come on, you were a former SEC attorney. <laughs> Uh, why cannabis? Why CBD? Why curcumin? Why now? Yeah, you know, so many people at first glance think I'm a weird person to be doing this, right? Like SEC attorney turned tech advisor and investor and, you know, mentor for like tech stars and new chip and like tech has really been my thing, right? Especially social impact. Um, and so, you know, I've really had a front row seat over the last few years to, you know, to the question of like, what's the most important technology, you know, for the future of humanity? And right now, what I think is so ironic is that the cannabis plant is one of the most incredible technologies that we have available to us. You know, so much of my work in the last two years has been focusing on the human OS, right? It's our own operating system. And I think if we can have some modifications to that human OS, um, that's gonna have some profound effects for humanity. And right now, you know, cannabis and hemp derived products are a really good avenue toward those sort of state changes that, that we can achieve that I think have some pretty profound effects. The human OS, I love it. 
Yeah. Uh, what can our community do, do to help AMA grow? Are you looking for board members, investors, advisors? What's the goal? Yeah, you know, we're really fortunate to have a team that's done really well, like in the sort of CPG wellness space before, you know, some of our co-founders have built companies that are doing, you know, a little under 100 million in revenue right now. And so, you know, one thing that I think is common to all of us who have been successful is just having the humility to realize that it really takes a village. And one of the things that I just so deeply appreciate about the ArcView network is how much people care um, about helping. And so, you know, on one hand, like, yes, you know, we're now scaling very quickly that we're having, you know, more complex and bigger company challenges, right? So we need board members, we need additional advisors, we're doing a small bridge round right now, and we need, you know, strategic investors. But more than anything, I would just call out to, like, who are the real zealots here, right? Um, that believe in this mission of plant-based healing um, and would say, just connect with us and come join our community because, you know, we're just incredibly purpose-driven and, and we want to be, yeah, just, you know, syncing up with the people who see this as a means of, of onboarding people to like these types of shifts in consciousness that they might not otherwise have access to. All right. And I, I've had the, uh, the fortunate opportunity to, to try Elevate. Uh, I've mixed some recipes at home, including yeah. an infused white Russian, which was, uh, which was phenomenal. Now, what are you doing to innovate here and, and uh, drive further op adoption of, of mocktails? Yeah, so, you know, I'm like an amateur mixologist too, right? But I think, you know, it's recognizing that there are people who are so much better at it than we are. So, you know, we've been teaming up with leading restaurateurs, mixologists, people who have won all these international awards for mixology um, to come up with recipes together because I think this is how we get this revolution started, right? Um, and get people, you know, to realize that there are alternatives to alcohol for them. You know, we need to get them in the door because once people try the products and they have this somatic experience, it's powerful for them. But the way we convince them to try it in the first place is giving them something that looks a lot like things that they're already experienced with. And I think like the well-crafted cocktail and mocktail is just a perfect example of that. Um, and people are used to having a drink when when they go into a restaurant and one of the things that's really cool and one of the reasons that restaurateurs have been loving it is when you start your evening with one of our drinks, it's bringing you into this calm, present, grounded state where you feel really connected to the people that you're with. And that sets the tone for the entire evening for them to have this like pleasant hospitality experience, you know, a little bit more globally. Um, so I think that's the direction that, that we're going in on that front. I think it's the key to business meetings and networking, you know, I want to start yeah. off with that, that positive alignment. Um, excellent. So why do you feel like this, this new Elevate product is performing so well for you? I mean, CBD beverages, it's a crowded space. Alcohol yeah. clearly has a stranglehold on our culture. Uh, love to hear it. Yeah, you know, I think about this a lot. And I think the main reason is that we don't position ourselves as a cannabis company. We don't position Elevate as a CBD beverage. It's a true alcohol alternative, right? And I think, like, I just find in this community in general, we're often very critical of alcohol and we don't have enough reverence for the rituals that are associated with it, right? Like the cold beer at the end of a hard day, glass of Chardonnay when kids go to bed, the champagne toast, right? Like these are rituals that have so much meaning, you know? And I think it's about like crossing this threshold, right? Going from this profane time of stuck in traffic, punching the clock, doing emails to like just crossing that threshold, right? And having a moment that's kind of sanctified. And so I think that's the reason it's been doing really well is we're letting people keep the same ritual that they're used to for unwinding and relaxing. We're just giving them a healthier alternative to try, right? And we're able to really closely mimic the sort of unwinding, right? The tuning into like your parasympathetic nervous system, getting out of that fight or flight mode, you know, that people associate with alcohol, just one that has all these incredible health benefits and, you know, isn't going to poison you, right? Excellent. Yeah, I, I can attest. Um, well, what is the best way to get in touch with you? Ted at amahealing.co. I mean, do you have any offers as, as well you're currently running? Yeah, uh, Ted at amahealing.co or partners at amahealing.co um, will come to me. Um, we're doing 20% off our products right now using code ARCVIEW. Um, you can go to amahealing.co slash elevate to check that out. I think someone dropped it in the chat. Um, and, you know, we're total nerds for this stuff. Like if anyone's working on interesting new formulations for beverages, you know, would love to connect. We really try and keep our ear to the ground of what's the latest and greatest, you know, kind of upcoming stuff in the space. So yeah, I would love to just, you know, chat with anyone who's interested or people who want to talk about, you know, the shift towards like low and no alcohol kind of generally, you know, we're trying to really be a part of this cultural movement, right. That's taking place right now. Um, so I'd love to connect with anyone who's interested in that too. Excellent. Well, Ted, we can't thank you enough for sponsoring this panel and joining today. I needless to say, I'm a big 
a big ama fiend um so <laughs> i think this worked out great and, and i know that our community will love your products uh looking forward to, to keeping the ball rolling and keeping the momentum but thanks again for today and as a recap it yeah, is no, ama healing i yep. think uh dot co slash I, I can only carry one come back oh yes i'm gonna have my zango oh uh, is that jeremy you might want to mute him here um all righty well of course that's the end of jake's sponsor corner but we're not done yet uh a webinar survey will have popped up this is uh our, our way of understanding what's important to you what kind of content you want to hear from our webinars that arcview is putting out so please fill out that survey if you can we want to hear straight from the horse's mouth um, for ArcView group members, join us actually at the after party immediately following this webinar. You did receive an email, so register and you'll need to jump off this link, pop into the other one. Um, but ultimately, you know, this is a chance to keep the conversation going with, with many of our panelists and speakers today. Uh, a little, little bit of virtual networking, virtual happy hour, trying to bring people together. Uh, if only we had beverages that we could all consume in, in parallel. Uh, but uh, the best way to keep a track, keep, keep, uh, keep on top of what we're doing here at ArcView is to head to arcviewaccess.com. So all of our latest activities, our events, everything is aggregated there. You can download the BDSA presentation that Jessica Lucas shared with us earlier in the webinar. You have a, our new discovery memberships. We're doing a whole LMS education video training series that we want you to participate in. There are, of course, memberships to win, our Women in Cannabis Networking, membership, or networking, networking Organization. Um, and of course, there's some new stuff up there. Cannabis investing first base. This is a four part course, kind of a starting point for anybody new to cannabis investment. What do we have coming up? A million different things uh, after 4th of July for the most part, except for tomorrow. We're going to kick things off with a virtual tour. So I'm very excited to report that CanSafe, uh, CanSafe we're going to have a, a tour of their HQ tomorrow. Uh, these are free for members. They're 50 bucks, you know, uh, until tomorrow for non-members. Otherwise, they'll be 75. Um, we also have on Wednesday, July 15th, another ARCU Access discussing live the international the topics of international cannabis. So a panel similar to today, but with some experts speaking about the international ecosystem. Uh, for members and their guests, I will have to make you aware, of course, of our ARCU Access Elite. This is July 8th. This is the next chance to hear a great roster of companies pitching for investment consideration, another showcase event. Uh, followed by Monday, June 13th, our Women Investor Network. This is another one of our great meetings um, where we'll have basically our few members, invited guests, speaking about what's happening, uh, of course, in the cannabis ecosystem with a specific focus on women, cannabis investors and operators. And then live and in person, I cannot believe I get to say this, um, we're going to do an in-person event. It's happening this August 16th. It's in the Hamptons. It's a VIP soiree. Um, so get your tickets now. You've probably got a million emails about it if you're an ArcView member. Uh, if not, uh, of course, just head to, to ArcView's, you know, ArcView Access, ArcView's page, or email us directly. Now, there are some other ways to get involved and stay connected with this community. Join the ArcView LinkedIn Lounge, where our community stays connected. Great place to keep that networking going. ArcView's Market Research, the number one cited research in the cannabis industry, just released the State of Legal Cannabis Markets 8th edition. So we've been doing these for a long time. You better get uh, get literate on what's been happening in this industry by uh, downloading a copy of the State of Legal Cannabis Markets 8 with our partners over at BDSA. And visit arcviewaccess.com for more information on all the ways to engage with this community. Um, well, I'll see you at the after party. We're gonna close things out for, from here. And once again, wanna thank Lagunitas, Kiva, Pantry, Carolyn Levy, I mean, this lineup, and, and of course, BDSA, given that presentation, um, you can't ask for a better lineup than this. And, and of course, Ted, I'm a healing. Uh, we would not be here today if it wasn't for them. So thank you again for everybody who's joined today. From here, fill out that survey, engage with some of these other links that you're seeing on the screen right now. Head to arcviewdaccess.com uh, and join the Afterhang if you're a member to get up close and personal with this community. Thank you and have a great 4th of July and Canada Day.